we are moving uh, uh, to the um, next uh, uh, topic, and this was the topic from which this conference, uh, the idea of this conference has appeared, so it's the uh, theme of forgiveness. Uh, um, but when we developed the, the, the idea of the conference, of metanoia came into the title as well, because we thought, well, one cannot have forgiveness without metanoia. Uh, but uh, um, uh, yesterday, uh, we have spoke a lot about forgiveness, and today maybe a little bit less. But now I would like to invite uh, um, Marina Cantacuzina to come to the stage and just say a few words about her, although she has uh, things to say about herself in, in this presentation. Um, uh, she uh, is a journalist uh, who has published uh, in the Huffington Post, in the Guardian, in other um, 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 uh, journals and newspapers. And uh, uh, what she is going to talk about today is uh, the forgiveness project, which she has founded um, in, in, in the UK. As a, as a kind of personal response to the escalating global conflict in 2003 with, with the war in, in the Middle East. So she had started collecting stories in words and pictures from the people who lived through violence, tragedy and injustice and sought forgiveness uh, and reconciliation rather than retaliation or revenge. And from this emerged uh, what she called the F word exhibition, uh, a collection of images and narratives from around the world exploring forgiveness and understanding in the face of atrocity. So she will um, speak a little bit about this, I believe, and so I would just like to, yes, invite you to come. Thank you, Irena. Um, it is the responsibility of the living to heal the dead. Uh, these words were spoken to me by a woman called Alexandra Asseli, and she is the founder of the Center for Lebanese Studies in Oxford and the creator of the Garden of Forgiveness in Lebanon. Asseli has written extensively about the repetitive nature of conflict, about how conscious and unconscious grievances are received by each new generation through what she calls ancestral, an ancestral bond. Such grievance stories passed down from grandparents to grandchildren, from teachers to pupils, from parents to offspring, she believes can only be transcended through compassion or forgiveness. So I think it's a really strong argument and a useful example of the power of forgiveness to move the story along, to change the direction, to turn the page where nothing else can. When the original perpetrators are long dead or when justice is not possible, forgiveness, mercy and pardoning may be the only strategy we have to prevent old wounds and resentments festering across generations. Another man, person who inspired me was Dr. Duncan Morrow, a lecturer in politics at the University of Ulster, who for 30 years has worked for reconciliation in Northern Ireland. He's spoken interestingly on the subject of justice. He says, in the context of sectarianism, he warns, Justice is dependent on the existence of an authority seen as just. And when that is absent, or when opposing groups disagree as to who is the victim and who is the perpetrator, then who can bring justice? Because of this, Morrow talks about the impossible and yet essential need for forgiveness in conflicts where facts and truth are often unobtainable the impossible and yet essential need for forgiveness, a paradox, which for me sums up this most fascinating, enigmatic, uh, 
confusing, contentious, and yet deeply transformative subject of forgiveness. So in this talk, I'm going to talk, focus on the healing power of stories, which I believe can change the national psyche. Uh, but first, I just want to tell you a little bit about the Forgiveness Project. It's a charity and how I started it. So the story starts in 2003. I was working as a freelance journalist living in London when in March that year there was this picture of 12-year-old Ali Abbas, whose haunted, traumatised eyes stared out from newspapers across the world. Ali had lost both his arms and his entire family when a US missile attack hit his home in Baghdad. For the record, I was against this invasion, convinced that the more you come down hard on people, the more they regroup and re-emerge in a toughened and more resistant way. And this photograph, which I've cropped, horrified me. But it compelled me as a journalist to search out real stories from people from around the world, stories which focused on empathy, compassion and forgiveness, and which demonstrated peaceful solutions to conflict. This was a private project, which I did in my spare time with a friend, colleague, who was a photographer. Um, and it was a project fueled by anger. I was determined to find evidence that showed retribution was not the answer to conflict. And in that first year, I collected 26 stories. And those, that's, those stories became the F Word exhibition, which launched in London in 2004. And I called the exhibition the F Word because I don't know if you understand the connotation, but um, English speakers will. Because by now I knew forgiveness was a highly provocative subject that cut public opinion down the middle like a guillotine. So there were those people who were terribly inspired by it and other people who were really affronted by it. So this exhibition of portraits and interviews documented stories about forgiveness and reconciliation from victims who had undergone suffering at the hands of others, but also from perpetrators who had transformed their aggression into a force for peace. Nothing I'd written about before had attracted such a response. Interest came from all over the world, um, and people wanting to use this resource of stories for their own work in conflict resolution. The F Word exhibition seemed to tap into a deep public need to find something humane in a world so full of hate. And that's when I started this charity called The Forgiveness Project, um, a secular organization that collects, curates, and sh real stories of transformation. Often the stories do come from a religious perspective. Um, in order to promote tolerance and help build a less divided society. Since then, we have collected many more stories, and the F Word exhibition has been to 14 countries, seen by 70,000 people in venues as diverse as a prison in Minneapolis, a shopping centre in Sydney, up at the top, a hospital in England, south coast, many faith and education institutions, the EU in Brussels to commemorate the centenary of the First World War, in a project about memory, and it's been all around Kenya to support nonviolence in the lead up to the elections. And just briefly, this is the other things we do. We have created an online educational resource which is used by teachers in the classroom, and we hold events, have an annual lecture. First one was given by Desmond Tutu. Um, we try to promote ideas about forgiveness through our published books. Um, and we've developed a prison program called Restore which is a group-based story-sharing process facilitated and led by both a victim of crime and an ex-offender who model this kind of restorative process um, and support prisoners to change the narrative of their lives. Now, if you Google forgiveness images, this is what you find. Now, nothing, none of them really do it for me. They don't quite work because they seem to present forgiveness as solely this kind of magical, mystical, religious experience. And of course, forgiveness can be all of these things, but it can also be messy and complicated. I've never wanted these stories to simplify or sanctify forgiveness. I don't want to express forgiveness as just for the morally 
um, superior or the mentally strong. I know it should never be prescribed because if you make forgiveness um, a duty, it becomes a kind of tyranny. Uh, for instance, one of our storytellers whose sister was murdered in a terrorist attack in Burundi has criticized the rhetoric of forgiveness used by the politicians there because he says it has prevented those responsible from being held accountable. The stories shared by the Forgiveness Project all express the process of forgiveness differently. For some it is sudden, for others it takes years. Um, often it grows out of anger, grief or hatred, which has left people exhausted and looking for another way forward. Forgiveness may involve reconciliation, but it doesn't have to. It may be entirely pragmatic, something you do for the greater good, or it may manifest as a path to self-healing. I should perhaps try and just define here what I mean by forgiveness. Uh, firstly, I see it as a verb rather than a noun, because it isn't static, it's fluid, it can change. It's something that is probably easier to identify through behavior than words. In that I've known people describe themselves as forgiving, forgiving and yet, to be honest, you're sort of acting quite the opposite. And equally, I've known some people who say they don't forgive, can't forgive, will never forgive, and yet they behave in an you know, entirely forgiving way. So I've come to see forgiveness as suggesting the following. For me, it's about a kind of internal conflict resolution, about making peace and reconciling with things that we cannot change or people we cannot change. In friendships and intimate relationships, it's about giving up the expectation that people should behave as we want them to. In crimes which are unspeakable, it's not about forgiving the act. It's about forgiving humanity for its fallibility and for failing. And it's about understanding that even those we hate are human beings like us, like us deserving of compassion and empathy. The American poet Longfellow wrote, if we could read the secret history of our enemies, we would find in each person's life sorrow and suffering enough to disarm all hostility. But my favorite description of forgiveness has been attributed to the author Mark Twain, who said, forgiveness is the fragrance that the violet sheds on the heel that has crushed it. And I really like that because it shows that pain is the motivator to forgive, that it's messy, but also that it's this kind of healing balm. There are multiple meanings, and it's highly contentious, as I said before. And this illustration, by the way, comes from a small book that I've written with a um, psychologist. It's an illustrated book, and it's based on the research around forgiveness and the evidence. It's contentious because the, there, are, there are those who believe the act of forgiving simply rewards bad behavior. And it's contested because there are two very distinct positions, and we've heard a lot about repentance, but there are those, for instance, who believe that forgiveness is a contractual relationship between the wrong the wronged and the wrongdoer, that it has to be earned through apology and remorse and making amends. And then there are others who say that's absolutely wrong and that forgiveness is an act of self-healing and has nothing to do with the perpetrator because if your peace of mind depends on an apology and remorse, which you may never get for multiple reasons, you are simply then putting the power back in the hands of the person who's hurt you. Now, Eva Kaur, who's one of our storytellers, who's a survivor of Auschwitz, Auschwitz tries to explain to her many critics, because she talks about forgiveness, um, she says she finally came after years to forgive her Nazi persecutors. She says, not because they deserve it, but because I deserve it. So for her, forgiving is an act of self-compassion. It's freed her from the burden of hate. So we can think about responses to being hurt. One way of, of looking at, at it is as an effective response to less. <coughs> One way of looking at forgiveness is that it can be a very effective response to less, a way of lessening pain. 
Um, indeed, multiple research studies show that having a forgiving personality is beneficial for your mental and physical health. One study even showed that it could extend your life by a number of years. So how do people respond to being very hurt? Maya Angelou, because silence is one of the big ones, and Maya Angelou said there is no greater agony than bearing an untold story um, inside you. Silence can actually help you initially because you retreat and it's protecting yourself. But in the end, I think over years, silence just defends the abuser and disempowers the victim. Or you can let it eat away at you, self-medicate with drugs, alcohol, self-harm. You can dump it on others by retaliating. Or you see another way is this path of compassion. And this is what I found many of the Forgiveness Project storytellers have chosen. They see it as a creative path because it frees them from the intrusive thoughts, from revenge fantasies and from enduring self-pity. It changes the narrative and creates this kind of common humanity. But I also really think it's important to make the point that there are times when forgiveness may not be a helpful response. For example, right in the middle of heated conflict, whether between nations or families, because at that point, people are just hell-bent on survival and on winning. As the, there often needs to be a season of rage and hatred. Forgiving is really part of the aftermath, of part of the building back, of the heart of the repairing. Um, this is a, um, an image created by a prisoner in one of our programs. And it says, there's two sides to every story, so never judge a book by its cover. And this woman who did this actually had never ever drawn before. I think it's a remarkable image. So stories spark conversations. Um, and they can really get people to think differently, I think. They, they stories stick in the way that facts fade. They awaken the imagination. Uh, stories can reach across the rifts of gender, of race, of creed, even the rifts of enemies. And I think, therefore, being exposed to stories from people we might otherwise dismiss, or from people who are very different from us, helps us to build empathy. Because um, meeting people who are different from us challenges our expectations and inevitably, hopefully, encourages greater to uh, tolerance. I love what the German poet Rilke says or said. He said, I live my life in widening circles that reach out across the world. So storytelling can be a very useful tool. I know this from my journalist days. Um, and it can be useful when reconciling hostile, hostile communities because it allows people from opposite sides to understand that pain is the same whoever you are. The pain of losing a child, for instance, is a universal pain. And it was this realization that gave birth to the amazing Israeli-Palestinian organization called the Parents Circle. But since stories are so powerful, they can harm as much as they can heal. They can fan the flames of prejudice, and they can normalize hate. Um, I think especially in our digital age, where the internet seems to have turbocharged abuse. Um, I was in Rwanda just before the 20th century at the Kigali Memorial Museum. Someone working there warned me that critical to the future of their country would be the stories that people chose to share to mark the upcoming approaching anniversary. And he was expressing a need to, yes, remember the pain and brutality, but also to highlight stories and memories that could be presented in a way that encouraged healing and reconciliation. I think the words of Pumla Gaboda Madagazeli, who's the South African psychologist, author of A Human Being Died That Night, are important here. Uh, Pumla says, if memory is kept alive in order to cultivate old hatreds and resentments, it is likely to culminate in vengeance and in a repetition of violence. But if memory is kept alive in order to transcend hateful emotions, then remembering can be healing. The stories from Rwanda that the Forgiveness Project shares don't minimize the horror of what happened, but they do show how people have rebuilt their lives and in some cases reconciled 
As the poet Ben Okri said, stories are the secret reservoirs of values. Change the stories individuals and nations live by and tell themselves, and you change the individuals and nations. This is why I choose to work with what I call restorative stories. Um, sto in other words, stories that heal, rehumanize, and restore. Restor restorative narratives show how nations rebuild after war, how families reconcile after conflict, and how individuals recover from a broken heart. And I think today, in a world of polarized and divided politics, these healing narratives act as a powerful and necessary antidote to the far too prevalent stories of hate, insularity, and division. So I just really want to end um, with showing you the four, I often think a lot about forgiveness, what it takes to the four, um, four kind of key ingredients of forgiveness. So curiosity. Curiosity is a, a really vital ingredient to forgiving because it fuels an inquiring and open mind um, as you move from why me to thinking why them. Wonder and curiosity keep us from behaving as if we have everything figured out. Um, and I'm going to just share four of the people who I work with in the Forgiveness Project whose stories we share. So Linda Beale is standing here in the middle. She lost her daughter Amy in 1993. An American Fulbright, Fulbright scholar working in South Africa against apartheid, Amy was beaten and stabbed to death in a black township near Cape Town. In 1998, the four youths convicted of her murder were granted amnesty by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission after serving five years of their sentence. A decision supported by Amy's parents. At the hearing, Peter Beale, Amy's father, spoke for both him and his wife when he addressed the court, which included the perpetrators and their families. And Peter Beale said, we are here to reconcile a human life which was taken without an opportunity for dialogue. When we are finished with this process, we must move forward with linked arms. A year later, Amy's parents went even further and decided they wanted to meet the killers. Linda said, we wanted to meet them. It wasn't about pity or blame, but about understanding. And as a result, Easy and Tumbeko, two of the convicted men pictured here, became friends with the Beals and were given jobs at the Amy Beale Foundation Trust in Cape Town. This extraordinary turn of events happened because the Beals started out with curiosity. They couldn't help but wonder what conditions might lead to a black youth in South Africa seeing a white woman's life as so worthless. Then we have perspective. Having curiosity means you have an open mind which leads to developing a broader perspective and worldview. Forgivers are flexible thinkers who seek to understand others. And this is Jill Hicks, who was catapulted into developing a new way of seeing things when she found herself in July the 7th, 2005, on the tube in London, standing next to a suicide bomber. She lost both her legs in the attack, and since then has become what she describes as a reluctant peace activist. Reluctant in the, in the sense that she never chose or wanted to be in this position, but in the pitch dark of the bombed carriage, she made a vow that if she survived, she would honor life by trying to live without hatred. It was a pledge, this violence ends with me. In other words, that she would not continue the cycle. Her drive is to understand, and even though she says she will never be able to make sense of why a young man she didn't know hated her enough to kill her, still what happened has given her a gift of a more humane and more inclusive perspective. And she says, I could never have imagined that a 19-year-old suicide bomber would actually teach me a valuable lesson. He taught me to never presume anything about anyone you don't know. Empathy is the third, um, and it's about walking in someone else's shoes, no, no matter how dirty or ill-fitting those shoes may be. 
And this is Grace Idua, who lives in London. Her 14-year-old most treasured son was killed. Um, the killer, Elijah, was charged with murder and sentenced to prison, in prison. And for a long time, Grace felt nothing but rage and despair. But one day, overwhelmed by grief, she decided she had to meet with Elijah to ask why. So a meeting was arranged in the prison. It was very sad and upsetting. Um, and in the room, she saw him slumped over, not able to look her in the eye. The prison chaplain told her this had nearly been cancelled because Elijah had been crying all night. Um, and then she asked him why he had done it. And he said he'd done it because the boy, David was from a rival school and Elijah happened to have a knife in his pocket that day. And Grace, when her, Grace heard this, she fell down and she cried. She said it was the first time she'd cried in front of strangers. And then she told me what happened next. She said, when I recovered, I told Elijah, I'm not crying for David, I'm crying for you. What have you done with your life? Then she asks him to write to her sons. This brings a lot of healing. And it's the beginning of a big journey with Grace now working with us in prisons. The last element, which is really important, is meaning making. Um, I think people are able to somehow not make sense of trauma and, and pain, but they're able to do something with it which can be useful for themselves and for others. So this is Bassem Araman. His story shows all the qualities of empathy, empathy perspective-taking, curiosity, and meaning-making. He's a former terrorist or freedom fighter, however you look at it, from Palestine's West Bank. At 16, he tried to blow up an Israeli military convey with a grenade. He failed and was sentenced to seven years in prison. There he was shown a film about the Holocaust. Till then he thought the Holocaust was a myth and he wanted to watch the film because he thought he'd enjoy, enjoy seeing Jews being killed. However, when he saw what happened, he broke down crying. It was, he said, the first time he felt empathy for his oppressors and it was the start of a friendship with one of his guards. After prison, Bassam started a group called Combatants for Peace an organization where fighters on both sides work together to find common ground. And Bassam once hated Israelis, but by knowing them and working together with them for peace, he overcome this, this hate. Even after the military shot and killed his daughter near her school, he didn't hate them, remarkably. <clears throat> Actually, he did even forgive the, the shooter, seeing him as a product of the same hateful system. And he says, I think very beautifully, for me, there was no reason, for, no, no, for me, there was no return from nonviolence. After all, it was one Israeli soldier who shot my daughter, but 100 former Israeli soldiers who built a garden in her name at the school where she was murdered. So you can see these stories really are very moving and they have a great impact on people. And this is really why I like to share them at the end of my presentation. And I just want to go back to the initial quote. Um, it is the responsibility of the living to heal the dead, which was actually by, um, it wasn't by Alexandria Sely, it was by a psychoanalyst called Roger Woolger. And this is the full quote. It is the responsibility of the living to heal the dead. Otherwise, their unfinished business will continue to play out in our fears phobias and illnesses. So I really believe that the responsibility lies with all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Marina. Um, and uh, we have a little bit of time for uh, for questions before the next uh, presentation, so please. Any questions? Здравствуйте, спасибо. Скажите, пожалуйста. Okay. 
Спасибо вам большое. Мне созрел вопрос. Скажите, пожалуйста, всегда ли прощение пострадавшей стороны отзывается в сердце преступника и те благополучные исходы, о которых вы рассказали, это, как правило, случается со всеми? Или же есть истории, которые имеют другой исход, когда сердце и душа преступника остаются глуха? Если, если я хорошо пояснила вопрос, можно... Yes, yes, I've understood. I've understood. Um, the stories are so different, all of them, and I really wanted to make them different. I didn't want to try and present something which was telling people there is one path or one way, or that you know everything ends in this place of magical forgiveness. They show it as complex, and they show it sometimes the perpetrators don't want to listen and don't want to hear, and don't a victim might move towards a perpetrator or a wrongdoer and there's no response, and that person somehow still is able to find peace in their heart. Um, and there are some cases where the perpetrator is healed through the love and compassion that is extended, because it disarms them, it makes them see the world in a different way. It's a very, very powerful tool, not only for changing the forgiver, but for changing the person who's being forgiven. Спасибо. Their do, uh, wrongdoings. So, um, and then in that situation, uh, the uh, the victim uh, uh, forgives, and they can have this communication. Uh, but the situation in which the transgressor is not present and is not punished, and uh, so there is this, uh, of course. Um, um, a very justified uh, um, um, desire for for justice, for for just mm -hmm. calling the, the transgressor, uh, you know. Mm -hmm. So that this step, I mean, does it kind of reflect in your stories yeah. that you can forgive only after that this has been called? Uh, there are many stories where there is no no reconciliation, no response, no dialogue, no remorse, no apology, but the person. <laughs> feels that forgiveness, which is the giving of compassion for healing, is the best response, not only for the world, the society, their friends, their, their health, their heart, but it's a choice. So, you know, we have all those different stories. I may have chosen more to do just for the examples here, which are few and far. We have 200 plus stories that I've interviewed and Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, if there are no questions, yes, so let's thank Marina. <laughs>